Welcome in our co-host on the morning, the Sarge, the Badger. He's got a lot of nicknames. Mike Heights, he's also a delegate. Good morning, Michael. Good morning, Robert. It's great to be here this morning. Uh, Bill will not be able to make it in this morning. We'll miss him. But uh, we'll have uh, Bill back on uh, on Monday. Our guest in this segment is none other than the Senate president who's in the Bill Stubblefield seat, I might add, uh, Mr. Craig Blair. Good morning, sir. Good morning. Uh, thank you for having me on this morning. May I start something out? Certainly. Y- okay, yesterday I was I knew Eric Tarr was going to be on, and I wanted to hear it. So I tuned in to Channel 10. Mm-hmm. First time I've ever watched this show. I'd like to give you guys credit for ruining radio. And the reason for it is... <laughs> A lot is of people that, have said that to me. <laughs> yeah, when, when it comes to radio, you could come in dressed in dirty clothes, your hair all messed up if you had... Whatever it may be, and mm-hmm. you do your job, and you move on. Not anymore. No. Nope. You get to see everybody. Matt Harvey, I did not recognize him of uh, when he was on the show. I could tell by him speaking sure. who he was, but he looked different from the camera. So, But actually, I do commend you uh, because it was very interesting being able to watch the show on Channel 10 and watch the interactions with everybody. I mm-hmm. liked it. That was uh, Mike Hornby. Uh, I'm not sure how much uh, Mike Kite also had to do with that when the two of them uh, bought the place from uh, Rick Wachtel back in 15, 16, I guess it was. Yeah. And one of the first things Mike uh, wanted to do, it was kind of a fascinating conversation because uh, I remember Mike Height saying, uh, what are all your pictures doing on the website? None of you people are good enough to be on, on camera. You're all radio people. <laughs> and then Hornby stuck a, stuck a camera right in our faces. Well, that's what I always liked about radio. I could come in here in shorts or whatever it is that I wanted to do. Poor posture, lean back in my seat. Do you still whatever. do that? Yeah, it, but yeah, but the whole world can see it. <laughs> True, yeah, that's that's the other part of it, right? But, but you can still chill all you want, right? But no, a, a large Part of our audience does watch on TV 10 and on the Facebook live stream. So you have, uh, for the longest time, the mystery of radio was, I wonder what that person looks like. And, and if you see them, do they match their voice? And the answer is, most people, the what you hear in a voice, it doesn't match your imagination of what they look like. And and this has taken that imagination out of the equation. So now you know exactly what the person looks like. Yeah, yes, I can see Absolutely. that. Absolutely. Yeah. As you mentioned, we had Senator Eric Tarr on uh, yesterday. And I had thought about putting together the Eric Tarr intro to, to lead off the show today just to get your reaction from it, but I ran out of time uh, for that. He had some very strong things to say about the governor yesterday. That happens. <laughs> uh, but, <laughs> and in all honesty, I've had strong things to say in the past myself and put it pen to paper uh, when it comes to that. The fact of the matter is, is we have to work together. And that's one of the things about politics. When you disagree with something, the very person that you're disagreeing with, the very next day, you could be working on an issue that you need that person to be an ally and be in agreement and being able to work with. That's the way this process should work and shouldn't have carryover of animosity or whatever it may be. On that. Now, I'm not to, 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 to saying that Eric Tarr is not entitled to his perspective and his feelings. Everybody mm-hmm. is entitled to them and sharing them into the public. Uh, but as the Senate President, Lieutenant Governor, I have a job to be able to make it so that there's 33 other members of the Senate and then to, to, to get things across the finish line, to be able to work with the governor's office, to be able to work with the House of Delegates, and be able to make it so that we can move West Virginia forward. That is a vital role that you need to be able to do, and Speaker Hanshaw does a great job of that. Of uh, I'd like to think I do. Uh, the, the governor's office is great to work with in many, many, many instances of on being able to get things done and move in West Virginia in the right direction. And you can see it. You can see it in our numbers. You can see it on the wages. You can see it in the unemployment levels. You can see it on the economic development, the infrastructures. The list goes on. Uh, and when everybody's running the boat in the same direction and working together as a team, it pays dividends, and we keep accelerating to the top. I'm not going to be happy until we get to the top. Our, our people deserve it. They've been beat down for too long. I don't want to make an attempt to get you in trouble here, but as the Senate president, you're also the lieutenant governor, which makes you the first guy outside the governor's office. Okay. So one of the things that Finance Chairman Tarr said yesterday 
is that the governor throughout his administration has put his buddies in charge of things, which has created problems with these administrations, these 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 uh, uh, departments that he's put his buddies in front of, and then only after the department's been wrecked does, does a competent person get put in in place as a replacement. What do you think of that assessment of how the governor has handled appointments to major departments? It, 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 it. The governor has done a good job on making some appointments, and I've said that in this studio before. But then there are others uh, that has t- panned out not to be as good. Uh, Secretary Crouch is a prime example of that of the DHHR. And by the way, that's an unattainable position the way it was to begin with. So whether he's a good man, a uh, good administrator, or anything like that, it's irrelevant. The way the DHHR was set up, of was set up to fail for anybody that got into that role. And they have in the past. That's one of the things I carry institutional knowledge. I can name off all the previous ones that were there, and they all struggled with it, and many of them were actually good people. So what we've done is made changes, but there was a resistance to that change. Of And, and you know, I can be, I have a tendency in being loyal to the people that I work with on, on that. Uh, most of us do. That's sort of human nature. Uh, but when Secretary Crouch was saying, well, give us another year and we'll do this study, and they brought in the Crystal Group to be able to do it, the only thing I did was waste $1.2 million, I think it was, and we got the same results of what Secretary Crouch was wanting. That was the trigger, though, that finally told the legislature we had enough. We had enough. We were going to break it up into three different components, and we were going to phase in how we go by doing it. And you can see that there's an institutional problem with the DHHR. They've got some good employees. They've got some that are not quite so good. And But you can see, just like in Sissonville, where those two children were kept in dire situation uh, from that standpoint. Instances come through like that all the time. And it's such a big juggernaut, you just can't walk in and snap your finger and say, this is fixed. It's going to have to take a retraining of many of them. It's going to, there are many things that need to be done. But I, I'm glad we got into this. Mm-hmm. Uh, because one of the things is, is guardian ad litems. Of and being able to get the children and move through the court systems as quick as what they they should be and need to be and thing continuances take place. There's all kinds of problems with that. One of the things that we're working on is the making it so that state employees that are attorneys that that work in the legislature, for example, in the House and the Senate, we've got employees that they work year round. But make it so that they can be guardian ad litems, and then they go in and represent the cases, in some cases, to help take some of the load off to be able to move them through the system quicker. But what we get back from that also is is that the, Mike and I can't go and sit in on these hearings. They're closed door. But if you actually have somebody on the inside that can see what's taking place, not come back and talk specifically about that case, but about the structure of how the system is working, then they can come back and actually help educate us to be able to do things statutorily to make it so the system works better. And that doesn't mean that the, the judicial branch is not working with us, because they are. Uh, that, that we are all working together on trying to figure out how we can actually make it so that we've got better outcomes for our children in our state, whether it be education, whether it be the foster uh, care program. There is a whole host of things. But these are legacy issues that were let go for decades and decades. And and if I was a Democrat out there listening to this right now, it's, I'd be saying, well, you've had eight years to fix it. Yeah, well, we've had 80 years of stuff to fix, and so we've been trying to drink. It's been drinking from a fire hose, to be honest with you. And when you think that you've got one thing moving in the right direction, you find two other things that need to be done. And that's one of the 
one of the main reasons that I'm running for office again, because it's not done. I carry an institutional knowledge. I know how to get things done, and I want to get the things done to make it so that long term, after I'm dead and gone, that West Virginia is heading in the right direction to be in the state that it deserves to be, and that's a prosperous state. We should not be a poverty state. We should be a prosperous state, and the, and the potential is there. Delegate Michael Heights. Well, first I'm going to talk a little bit about um, Craig brought up. You know, you still have to work together after you don't get along. So the, I think there were a lot of people in the legislature that were really upset with the governor's office um, after he came in and sabotaged what I think were the, the four amendments that we tried to get passed um, last election cycle. And, I, you know, I believe that by sabotaging the one, he sabotaged all four. Um, but Afterwards, and that was all said and done, we still had to go back and work with him. And uh, I think the legislature has done a good job working with him in spite of all those things. You brought up DHHR and the DHHR and the split up of DHHR. And I think the legislature, their hope was that we, we found efficiencies within DHHR by splitting them up and that they wouldn't be so top heavy and, you know, they could, they could get to the core of issues by being three separate entities. In in the few meetings I've had um, in, in the health committee, House Health Committee, and, and on Locker itself, um, some of the things I'm hearing from those new heads um, doesn't seem to be that way sometimes. Um, they still seem like they want to come in and have all this top-heavy administration um, and I have some concerns about that. Um, uh, I think that's one of those things that um, the the legislature is going to have to monitor over the next couple of years to make sure that when they're they're setting up these uh, these new branches, um, uh, that the secretaries aren't having too many secondary people underneath of them and then people underneath of them and and that the dollars that we're we're saving or spending or whatever aren't getting down to the boots on the ground aren't getting down to those cps workers that you talk about and and where the core of the money is really needed so in your opinion how do we monitor that how do we hold them accountable now that they've been split up You've just demonstrated that by the committee meetings that you're listening to. And if you heard me say earlier, phase one, phase two, phase three, there could even be a phase four. You never can take the eye off the ball, especially on this. That's a huge, that they have more money than what our general revenue budget is on how they go about managing things. And then d d d d d these, look, look, it's not an easy job of on being able to manage that you're dealing with some of the worst situations uh, relentlessly day in day out that's and suck the life out of people uh but but also they need to be that, that that's where the structure needs to be changed where you can rotate people off and be doing different things have different sets of eyes on the case making sure that there's follow-through on the cases that are out there so that you actually can monitor that and get a good outcome. Right now, that doesn't happen in all cases. I can't say that happens 100% of the time. And the reason for it is, is there are t t t t success stories. And we need to be able to understand on those success stories and duplicate that over and over. And then there's a fine line. When I was talking about the Sissonville one, and that is, is people's privacy. When you're going and being able to go in and look at homes, people can actually put up quite the charade and make it so that that you think everything's fine and well, and then you walk out the door, then it goes back to being normal again. Or that normal wasn't the right word, abnormal or t terrible for, for that t t individual. But that's the key ingredient is to keep focus on the issue. And what happens is, so many times, is that we jump from one crisis to the next to the next. And I'm a believer in not doing that. My leadership style makes it so that I assign people to those issues, and they stick with it. And this is, remember I was hiring Jeremiah Samples? Uh, that, 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 
that was gold. Yes. Uh, and that there's a set of eyes that are on things that I get weekly reports on what we should be doing, what we shouldn't be doing. And I say, ah, the speaker gets them too because mm-hmm. we hired him through the joint committee. But that was one of the best things that we've ever done on being able to help us manage DHHR. Also, to manage PEIA. Uh, because Jeremiah's got quite the history of being able to understand that. He's a huge, huge asset for problem solving in the state of West Virginia and being able to move forward and hopefully get this settled out to where that we've got predictable outcomes for our youth. My other concern in the state right now is is on the education side. We ha- We have some of the highest per pupil spending on education in the nation, and yet we we are constantly at the bottom in ranking. Um, and you know, I, I get that the we tried to pass an amendment where we had some oversight over the Department of Education, the State Department of Education, and that just didn't pass. I'm, I'm just wondering, what is as legislators, what's our next step to try to rein in um, the issues with education? When we don't have any oversight over the Department of Education that seems to have the same problem that the Department of Health had, DHHR, um, where they're very, very top-heavy. So how do we now, without passing that amendment, rein them in and and get that that spending under control to help the kids of West Virginia? Delegate? sounds like that you share the same frustrations as what I share. And I would like to commend the voters of Berkeley County was the only county that passed all four of them. Amen. And, and they, 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 they got it. Uh, they got what was going on and understood. Now, right now, the, the State Department of Education is actually in a pretty good spot. Uh, the new superintendent, Michelle Blot, uh, whenever I called the president of the Board of Education, I at uh, Paul Hardesty, who used to serve in the Senate. So who, who are you going to appoint? Because I had an idea on who I wanted to appoint. It. And uh, he told me it was Michelle. And I was beyond ecstatic. But the problem is with this is that to, right now it's good. You can't be governing by the personalities that you have in the seat at that given point in time. You need to put the structure in place so that no matter who's in that seat, that you're going to have a predictable outcome and with upward mobility, in this case, of improvement in education. That's where Amendment 4 would have solved that problem a long term for that. But we don't have that at this point in time. I predict in the next uh couple years that we're going to see another ballot initiative that is going to take and address those four issues again so that we could, could, because if all four of them would have passed, we would have been on up faster. Outcome. Sure. I, I, don't, I, I don't know how to use the right words for this. We would have had better results if all four of those constitutional amendments on what we were trying to do. Uh, and let's also understand something else. There's a report out there where West Virginia was 50th on the SAT scores. Well, that's because all our students took them. Mm-hmm. Whereas Mississippi, there was only a, 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 a couple dozen of them that took it. And that's why they improved so much. And there's a big debate tonight, and I, and I have a little secret weapon. She may be listening right now, but her name's Sarah Stewart. She's my chief counsel of, and chief of staff for me to the dual role. And she came from the Department of Education. She, I knew her before she went there, and she is nothing short of brilliant. So when she hears these numbers, she's got an understanding of them to start with and immediately start digging into them and then coming back and saying, Craig, here's what's going on here, 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 and here. These numbers aren't as accurate as what they're making them out to be at this point in time. And then we start working on whether we should be using SAT or or. ACT, ACT yeah. of, and, and how we go about getting the assessments and, and understanding where we're at. I do know this much. And, and, and this, this came from the program yesterday. And, and that is, is that 
we we've moved and this is speaker Hanshaw's idea having an aid in first grade and then the second year an aid in first and second grade and then on third year an aid in first second and third grade mm-hmm. and i we all know that this is going to pay dividends we're certain of it the money that we're investing in this is going to pay dividends but it doesn't happen instantly this is uh, is this the arkansas model the mississippi model you know, honestly, I don't, I can't answer that. I know it was uh, one of those two where they used these aids in, uh, in, in kindergarten and they saw the reading uh, results improve dramatically. Right. I give the speaker credit for it because he's the one to come forward with it, it, it to, to me. And it just, it made all the sense in the world. Those are your formative years. That's when you're learning to read your math and all that. But so I planted, so I called Sarah up and I said, hey, I want you to think about something. Do we want to make it so that when this first grade aide is with this first grade group of students, do we want to move that aide along to second grade and new, and put in a new first grade one there for the next group so that you've got a den mother, a house mother, or whatever you want to call them, somebody that stays with that student for those three years. The teacher can change. But the aid is the same, and you develop those relationships for those three years. I think that we may actually have a better chance of an even greater outcome by doing that. And right now, we don't we don't have that in place. So I've got her working on this, and we're going to reach over to the State Department of Education. We're going to reach into the teachers, and that's a new thing that. You, Delegate, you probably don't know this. We're, we've got all the emails of the teachers now, and we are get, having direct contact with them, wanting them to feed us back information on what's in the classroom. Tell us how we can help and do you do a better job because these teachers do want to do a great job, but sometimes their hands are tied by an unelected body like the State Board of Education. Back yeah, I think there were, you know, we we passed some laws this past session, and um, I'm glad to hear that we have all the teachers' emails because I'm not so sure that 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 information, the new laws, were disseminated back down to the teacher level. Um, and one in particular was the the disruptive students within the class and how they could be removed from the class. I'm not so sure that that information got down to the teacher level. So I'm glad that we have an avenue where the legislature can go straight to the teacher and bypass some administration um, and get them information that they really need. We need to have that dialogue. Yes. Back and forth. I've been working on that for years, but it takes the right administration to be able to get the commitment to do Mm -hmm. that. Michelle Blatt is the person that can get things done. And, and I don't want to throw all administrations under the bus because I'm sure there were certain um, Board of Educations that, that provided that information. I'm just saying statewide, I, I know it wasn't disseminated down to all the, the teachers. And another question I want to ask you, we, I, I constantly am out in the community and hear constituents talk about Craig Blair. And a lot of what I hear about Craig Blair is, Craig does nothing for Berkeley County, does nothing for the Eastern Panhandle. And, and you know, I used to be one of those detractors. I used to say the same thing. But as a legislature, I get, I'm get i down in Charleston, and I see what you're doing behind the scenes, and I see what you're doing for the entire state of West Virginia, including the Eastern Panhandle. Um, and, and I think I've even told you, you know, you need to toot your own horn uh, sometimes because – People here in the in the Panhandle don't see what you're doing for the Panhandle, and you know, I'd just like to get your response from that. Why don't you toot your own horn? Why don't you tell the people what you're doing? And and sort of, ever all the other politicians pretty much do. You see people getting their picture taken in the paper all the time, but Craig Blair doesn't. But I know that you're doing things behind the scenes for for the Eastern Panhandle. So your response. First of all, I don't like getting my picture taken, and of uh, what I and I don't like taking credit. My my parents raised me better than that. I'm more interested in moving on to the next project. The Eastern Panhandle gets its fair share of, and there are at the, at the appropriate time. I may actually have to come out and show everybody the hundreds of millions of dollars that's come back into the Eastern Panhandle, but. 
We've we've also heard, as you and I both have, that all our tax dollars go to Charleston, and we hope to get some of them back. Yeah. Well, if you want to be able to keep your tax dollars at home, you need to be able to make it so the rest of West Virginia doesn't need those tax dollars. And those tax when we were an agrarian society here in the 50s and 60s, well, the coal, the, the, the severance taxes paid for our education and helped us, paid for our roads. We need to be able to make it so that we have more growth areas in this state. And and, that, and that's my goal. Uh, the, 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 uh, the largest investment ever in the state of West Virginia, $3.1 billion, uh, was last, what was it, Friday, I think it was, for uh, Thursday or Friday uh, over at Newcore in Mason yeah. County. We're having those growth areas. Uh, but I'm not one, one to talk about a whole lot of it in the past and, and what's going on. What I am t- talk about is what we can do in the future and what makes things better in the future. And that I'm very, very proud of. But to bring it home, just, let's just not forget the tax reduction. The flatline budget, who I was the author of that one, mm-hmm. and I don't mind taking credit for that. When people told me it was a dumb idea, and I'm like, no, it's a great idea. And I said, and if it works successfully, we're going to be fighting over how to spend the money. Yeah. That's exactly what took place. But everybody in the state of West Virginia, you got a job, you got a 21.25% reduction in your personal income tax and the personal property tax on your automobile, you're getting a refundable tax credit on that. We're sharing the wealth while we're building out the infrastructures in this state, while we're actually attracting economic opportunities into this state and we must stay on that path because we cannot afford to revert back where we come from i know i sound like a broken record and i know i evaded your question just a little bit <laughs> of but again i other people need to step forward and I, and I don't know where they will or not because i've told them if i get this money for you to be able to do this project, I don't want my picture taken. I don't want you telling people about it. And the reason for it is is that it'll line up 10 other groups that we may or may not have the money for, and their idea may or may not be a great idea that has a return on the investment for the state of West Virginia. So it puts me in the position of saying no. Right. And, and, and so I, I learned a long time ago to uh, to – save the tax dollars, to conserve those tax dollars, spend them wisely, and then if there are needs, then you get out there and you help them. The community participation grant money, LIDA money now, sure. uh, that is me bringing that back when I was the finance chairman mm-hmm. uh, so that legislators – actually had some money so if you had a senior citizen center that need a refrigerator or air conditioner i've got everybody funded from that standpoint and being able to have resources to go put out fires why because it's a good idea but it can't be the way it used to be to where the senate president or the finance chairman was able to scoop up everybody's money and use it for himself and that took place i watched it take place and it's like that is wrong so i put checks and balances in there so you don't you can't even use the money on the senate side you can't use it so that during the election process so that you can pass out money while you're on the campaign nope won't allow that that'll have to be an emergency to where the refrigerator's down and then the president and the governor and the senate finance chairman actually says yes that you can do it, that it's an emergency. <laughs> John, John just burst into the room. Yeah. We're just finishing I, the first segment still, John. And on that note, <laughs> sit down, stay, just, just stay. <laughs> on that note, we will go into our commercial break.